Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. And we yes. put a video up every week. So please subscribe, press the alert button so that it'll tell you when the next video comes up. And hopefully we'll have something to inspire you every week. Who wouldn't want to do that? But Stephen, I am curious. <laughs> yes. Do I see before me a row of what look like giant molars? What you actually see behind us is a cloud pruned hedge. And today is all about hedges as art. Well, I'm intrigued. This is the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. We're in a garden full of amazing hedges. You need to lead on and talk us through hedges as art. Why not indeed? Off we go. When is a hedge not a hedge? Well, a hedge is not a hedge when it's not being trimmed. So therefore it then becomes a screen. Or so a windbreak. Or a windbreak, mentioned. yes. yes. The bigger it gets, the, the terminology changes, of course. Yep. So hedges by nature are things that are manipulated and pruned and shaped. Okay. And that's exactly what we've got here, except mm. that it's not a classical hedge. That is very true. Yes. Why is it not a classical hedge? Stephen? Well, because it isn't being cut in a squared formal, formal way, yep. which would then make it a giant green fence basically, <laughs> uh, which is perfectly utilitarian and perfectly fine. Yeah. And that's how most people deal with their hedges. Yeah. But this one has become a work of art. And so it's been pruned by the hedger in this really lovely sort of amorphous form so that it becomes a feature in its own right. So it still does all the things a hedge has to do. Yeah but it's been lifted beyond being just a hedge. It is quite extraordinary. Well, let's go and look a little bit more and yep. we'll talk to some specifics about maintaining something like this. All right, why not indeed? Look at this. Oh, it's so, it's extraordinary. It I is, mean, isn't it? I'll be honest, it's perhaps not something I would choose to do, Stephen. Well, you probably, would you? well, yes, I possibly would yeah. uh, if I had the room to do something like this. It probably wouldn't work in your little terrace house in Melbourne, though. Might be I a bit claustrophobic. It, I could do it on a bonsai level. <laughs> but I'm intrigued. Um, to me, this looks very labour intensive. So can you talk through, All right. if this is what you want to do, yeah. firstly, is it easier to work with an established hedge? Because I think this one was already here and yes. then it was cut. Yeah, this one was actually an overgrown hedge. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it was quite a sensible move to turn it into a cloud hedge yeah. because to bring it into a squared, very formal hedge again yeah. uh, would have been somewhat difficult. And I understand from what the hedger tells me that part of this hedge actually was planted after. So ah. it's now melded in nicely and you would not know that in fact that no. part of this hedge is older and part of it's newer. So in fact, part of the strategy for this could be managing an overgrown hedge if yep. you bought a property and it's kind of out of control. Having said that, yes. there is a certain limit of out of control with conifers mm. because if you have to cut back into really old wood, then you tend to end up with dead patches because they don't shoot from old wood well. This was my question about mm. how far you can go with a conifer, yep. which then leads us, I suppose, to what is this what is this type? What's this All species? Right. <laughs> this is the dreaded Leyland cypress. Leyland cypress? Now, Am I right in thinking, because I grew up in England as a child, yes. that Leyland, Leylandi, was yes, it that, Leylandi yes. was wildly popular in the 70s. People were planting it everywhere as hedges, yep. and it had the most appalling reputation. Yeah, because, Why? well, several things. It grew incredibly fast, which was part of which the reason. Which was positive. Yeah, yeah, well, except when it gets taller than you want. So once it gets to a certain height, then suddenly you're cutting down your neighbour's light, and, you know, there, there were lots and lots of issues. And with on their side, it... It's wild and untamed. Well, that's the other thing. If you're planting a hedge, you have to know that you've got access to both sides of a hedge uh -huh. if you're going to manage it. Because yep. if the neighbours, if it's a boundary hedge and yep. the neighbours don't manage their side of the hedge and you can't get in to do it, then they'll end up with a tree on their side and you've got the formal hedge on your side. Good to remember. Yeah. So, yeah, so Leyland Cypress has a bad reputation. It, it has a very greedy root system. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to be trying to grow a nice perennial border in front of it. Um, uh -huh. In this position, it's so works it's, perfectly. It's on a gravel drive, so yeah. there's no and competition. There, and there's nothing behind it that matters, mm. so it's, it's, it's a standalone plant. So in terms of the fact that it consumes a lot of water, what is its kind of hardiness? Where is it from originally? Well, the Leyland Cypress is actually a hybrid. It was right. produced in cultivation. I can't remember exactly where now, but it's a cross between uh, a, a Lawson Cypress and a Macrocarpa Cypress. And because it's an intergenetic hybrid, it has great hybrid vigor. Right. They're cold hardy. Yes. They're fairly heat tolerant. 
they're fairly drought tolerant. They hate wet feet, so you certainly wouldn't plant a, a Leyland cypress hedge in low-lying wet soil. Yeah. But basically, it's a fairly easy hedge to, to manage, mm. other than the fact because it's fast growing, it needs to be trimmed fairly regularly. Which was my second question. How often would you trim it if it was just straight lines? And then how often would you trim something like this that's more sculptured and like Yeah, tapered? well, I don't think the actual often, oftenness, <laughs> a dreadful Great choice grass of, of English. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm really good with that. It doesn't probably matter whether it's a morphous sort of cloud hedge or a straight formal hedge, really. Yeah. It's more a matter of how persistent you want to be about keeping your lines and your shapes. If yep. you don't mind your hedge getting a little soft and furry about the edges mm -hmm. occasionally, mm -hmm. you might get away with trimming one of these hedges perhaps once a year. Yeah. If you want to keep strong lines or really clean lines on a hedge, then something like a Leyland Cypress hedge, probably two to three times a year would, would be necessary to keep it really sharp mm -hmm. and really, really smart. And the other thing is, given the heights of this, it does become a bit of a management issue about having the height to cut it so you need to bear that in mind I well too. look i think a lot of these hedges uh, unless you've got all the equipment that you could possibly need which yeah. could include a cherry picker you're probably better to contract these sorts of jobs out where you've got somebody who's got all that equipment and is a professional somebody who's got a good eye so that they know what they're doing uh, and then you can end up with the work of art that you really wanted they look very healthy mm. So hedges tend to be obviously a monoculture, it's one species, so yep. does that not mean they tend to be more prone to disease? And then is there anything you need to do in terms of fertilizer right. or general maintenance if you've just got one? Yeah, thing? all right, monocultures are always a little risky yeah. because if a disease gets in or some sort of issue arises, yes, you're done. You say you've got all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, but there is always the possibility of issues. Now, yeah. when it comes to conifers like cypresses and their ilk, yeah. the biggest potential problem in Australia certainly is cypress canker, which is a fungal disease that eats into the stem, mm. it girdles the stem, it stops that stem from taking up moisture and then you get a dead patch in your hedge. Ah. It's very hard to control and manage. Yeah. Certainly where this property is, it's nicely isolated out in farmland. There's a good chance that they might survive for forever, perhaps without getting cypress canker. But if you're in an area where that's already an issue, then it's very likely to take off into your hedge. And what do you do? What can you do? Not a lot. Uh, I mean, there right. are some, yes, there are some fungal, you go, viewers? Yeah, some fungal treatments that apparently have some impact, mm. but there's dispute as to whether they're really long-term efficient. As far as feeding and, and watering and so forth is concerned, obviously when you're working with a monoculture, you've got the had an advantage that they'll all want exactly the same thing at exactly the same True. time. So that, that sort of works. Uh, this is so logical. I'd never have thought of that. <laughs> Stephen, this yes. is why you're here yeah. and I'm not, but yeah. I am. If well, you are, <laughs> yes. So what will actually happen with a hedge like this is, I mean, it's in good, deep, um, rich, volcanic, uh, acidic soil. It mm. probably won't need a lot of feeding, but a once a year general fertilizer will probably keep it in good uh, tether. Mm. Watering is not going to be necessarily a huge problem, again, because it's a water retentive type of soil but on a nice slope so it drains away well yeah when we get one of our really dreadful drought years then you might have to give the whole hedge a good soaking perhaps once a month or once every six weeks okay but under That's normal lot, no under normal conditions this hedge is probably fairly self-managing hardy then you could grow this in the coldest of climates do you think just about uh i mean i'm not sure about northern alaska but you know in most in most places yes the leyland cypress can be a good hedge but it can also be a dreadful enemy if you plant it in the wrong place and don't manage it there you go We're Words of wisdom. Now I can see, I can see on the horizon what looks like a Neolithic fort, but it's green. Yes. Is that a Leylandi thing? What is yes. it? It is a, well, it's what the owner calls his rondelle, and it is a hedge on steroids. So I think we should go over and have a look at that Let's as well. Let's go and look at the hedge on steroids, because that is extraordinary. <laughs> it Lead certainly on. is. <laughs> So let's head off to the to the Norman encampment on the hill. <laughs> yes. But just back at this hedge behind us, um, if you wanted to use a different type of plant yeah. to achieve that look, could you? Well, you could to an extent, but conifer has such tight, thick foliage, or yeah. scaly needles really, yeah. uh, that it can make a really sharp, clean line better than almost anything else. <laughs> We're at the Norman Fort. Yes, we are, just about. All right, this thing, Rondell, is a little hard to understand and to get a sense of the scale. So here I am being scale. Well, Stephen told me to meet him by the Norman Ford on the hill. Stephen, where are you? Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan. 
Ooh. Oh my <laughs> Here I am. I've just I've just been inside this amazing edifice. Now, this I am just astounded by this thing is yes. all I can say it is. We should take the viewers inside yeah. and you can just talk to me about the creation of such a thing. It looks to me like a building made out of trees. Well, it, it sort of is, you know, but what do you call it? Is it a citadel? Is, is it a castle? Uh, goodness knows. It's called a rondelle here, which I think is probably far too minor a sort of term for it, well, but it is truly remarkable. Let's go and have a look and right. decide what it is. All right. <laughs> look at this. It's like Narnia. Where are the lions and the witches? And the smell. Mm. Oh. Yes, that conifer smell is something that just sticks with you, isn't it? It's amazing. So from the outside, it looks like a very large clipped hedge. But which it is. Which it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is when a hedge is not a hedge, but it is a hedge. Yes. So we've, we've entered in and it's a different world. Exactly, because this was actually a double planted hedge. Yeah. So it's a, it's a neat hedge on the inside. It's a neat hedge on the outside. Yeah. But of course, conifers are one of those groups of plants that don't like shading out. So of mm. course the internal branches, because you've got two rows of trees, yeah. have all over the years died. Yeah. So they've been trimmed off and suddenly you end up with this amazing cloister, it I guess. Is. It is a cloister, yeah. which makes me think that this is a building yes. almost. It's a living building, isn't yes. it? Yes, I feel like I, I, I should be wearing the appropriate it's, far, friars clothes. I know, clothes it feels here. quite monastic. Yeah, it does. In, I don't know, France or Italy or Greece in some amazing cloister. Yeah, and here we are in middle Victoria. It is just stunning. Yeah, and soft and scrunchy under feet. Yes. So what more could you want? Well, here we are inside the rondelle. And S look at this. The citadel, I don't yeah. know, a citadel. So, hmm, things to talk about. Yeah, um, so here's the thing. You create this drama and you create this amazing world so obviously when you come into it there kind of needs to be a point doesn't that yes and i think the owner would agree with me that what he's tried to do here hasn't actually worked so far no the idea was to have a carpet of violets over the ground and i yeah. think it gets too hot and dry in the summer for them yeah. so it was just going to be a carpet you had your entryway to come in you've got a seat in the middle and then you could just sit and i don't know contemplate your navel whatever you do smell the violets yes exactly and that was the plan but in practice it's a, it's a bit scrappy. Um, what would you do then? What would you suggest? I would discard all of the plant material that's in here. None yep. of it's overly precious anyway, no. so it could be used in other parts of the garden or yes. composted, whatever. Yep. Uh, I would then make sure it was clean of weeds because weeds are always going to be an issue if you're going to try and create a carpet type effect on the ground because mm. you don't want anything tall in here. It needs to all be low ground covery plants. Yeah. I would then probably put down a thick layer of some sort of attractive gravel, mm -hmm. something loose. It doesn't want to be something that would end up being a driveway. Yeah. So some sort of loose, perhaps quite chunky white and gray gravel would yeah. work quite well. And then I would plant patches of some sort of ground cover plant in here. Now in this climate, it's fairly cold in the winter, so it needs to be something that would be cold hardy mm. can get quite warm and muggy in here because it's an enclosed environment yeah. the owner has been talking about the possibility of using a plant called a juga which gets carpets of burgundy foliage and then spires of blue flowers and not not very tall not very tall only mm. only probably 15 20 centimeters depending on which one you used yeah. uh, which could work quite well it uh, would. but it will mean a complete clean out to start with interesting well it's i guess this is the whole point about gardening it's a work in progress isn't of it of course I'm it is sure you have had things that have failed have you Steve? No. Not that, I, not that I'll oh. admit. <laughs> of course I have. I mean, every nobody, no matter how good a gardener they are, I mean, you can have the best landscape designer in the world. You can have, you know, people that really know their stuff and they will still have things go wrong. Well, I guess that's the point. It's a living thing and it responds to different impetus. Exactly. You've got to roll with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, I did notice somewhere else another hedge. Oh, this garden is hedge upon hedge, but we do have another quite different hedge to have a look at. Okay, well, let's leave the calm and tranquility of the citadel and go and view the other hedge. What a good idea. Well, Matthew, here is another example of hedging that's being done just slightly differently than what you would expect. 
It is stunning. So it is multicolored. What are we calling this? This is a tapestry hedge. Aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. Yes, and it's made out of a mixture of green foliaged and copper foliaged beeches, so yep. Fagus sylvatica. Yep. Uh, it's more commonly seen in Europe than it is in Australia, but this one is a very good example of its type. I was going to say, there's a famous garden, I think, in Britain called Kifsgate, yes. which I think has a tapestry hedge. Didn't Vita Sackville West have one at Sissinghurst? To be honest, I don't remember seeing one at Sissinghurst. So there you go. Somebody will get in touch with us and tell us, won't yes, they? Yes, yes. Tapestry hedges. Where, yeah, where, where? Yeah. Now, there's a couple of things you need to sort of understand about a tapestry hedge. Normally, yes. you would plant a hedge out of vegetatively propagated cuttings of a clonally identical plant. Yes. Then you get continuity. Right. Everything grows at the same rate. Everything looks the same colour. It has the same form. So you can get that very sharp looking hedge. Interesting. I would never have thought of that, but this is why you're the guru. Yes. And I'm not. So this tapestry hedge is made up of seedling beaches. So they've just selected a batch of seedling green and seedling copper beaches. Right. So virtually every tree is going to be slightly different because they're all genetically dissimilar. Ah, so that's a bit of a wild card. So you don't know if one might mm. have a slightly different growth habit or... Yep. And in fact, they probably will. You'll probably find if you look at this hedge really closely, some of them will have stronger shoots coming out before pruning. Others will have shorter shoots. Some will be more pendulous looking. Yeah. So there is quite a diversity in it. Having said that though, because it's being planted as a tapestry hedge, that doesn't matter so much. If you're trying to grow a very formal, very exact hedge, then yes, you need clonal material. Right. So the tapestry hedge works. Interesting to bear in mind. So the other thing too about beech is obviously these are enormous trees. What are the issues around using something that is essentially a tree as a hedge in terms of how long will it be happy to remain a hedge before it goes berserk or will it thin out because it wants to be a tree? What's, mm, what's, what's Almost no to all those questions. There are hedges in England that have been grown a beech, some of which have been grown to seriously big hedges, so mm. they're almost trees anyway. But it tolerates heavy pruning regularly. There's no reason why this hedge couldn't be kept at about the proportions it is for decades. Oh, okay. Uh, so what will generally happen though is each year you'll trim the hedge just slightly longer than you did last time and slightly taller. And then in some years time when the hedge is slowly getting too big and too out of scale for the place that you've got it, then you'll actually cut well back into the hedge and then start it off again. So and, that's how it'll work. And same issues about monoculture in terms of disease and Yada, yada, yada. That's certainly a possibility, although having said that, because you're not using a clonal variety, there would you be... You might have more resistance. Yeah, you could. Some might ah. have more resistance, some might have less. So <laughs> there you go. So, Which perhaps also brings us to the point of the density of planting. What would the spacing be between plants, do you think? I think this hedge has been done at about metre, metre and a half spacings. Well, that's quite wide. Yeah, So, but it's grown as a tallish hedge. The shorter the hedge you're planting, mm -hmm. where, uh, as in the height you want it to be at, mm. uh, the closer the plants need to be to make a dense hedge. If you're going to grow them as a bigger hedge, then therefore the canopy can spread a bit further, therefore they can be a little further apart. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. So here we are on the inside, and I must say that perhaps we're transseasonal right now. It's looking very green, Stephen. It is looking very green, but there is in fact a whole successional thing going on on the inside of this hedge. Yep. The green and copper behind make a fantastic foil for certain colours in certain ranges. Right. What the owners tried to do here is to bounce off the hedge with different varieties of plants throughout the season. Yes. So we've just missed the tree peonies. But basically. we did a special on tree peonies, we which we can did. link above. Yeah. So there's the, the main body of this border is in fact tree peonies. Yes. And they were bought from an old nurseryman, sight unseen. So this was actually just pure happenstance, but they've all turned out to be either soft lemons or soft apricot pinks. That would look, because there is a huge arc, they would look amazing yeah. in bloom. Fantastic. We'll have to try and come here again or another, in the yeah, season. another season when the peonies are actually in bloom. But of course, they're, they're not a long season flowering no, so plant. This is my, my point. So you have the green foliage of the tree peonies now. Yeah. Later on, we have lupins. Mm -hmm. We have self-sown um, double and single poppies, uh, which are being encouraged through the border. Yes. Uh, I note there's small growing species gladioli in the border. Aquilegia. Aquilegia is in the border. And later in the summer, there'll be a mass of Crocosmia lucifer, which has these long spikes that come up with seriously eye scorching orangey red flowers. So interesting to point out that all of this looks amazing with the foil of the bright green and copper 
as a backdrop yeah, of the beaches. Yeah. So it sort of anchors the whole border. It also protects it and you know all the things that you want a hedge to do, but it's just that little bit interesting and different. And there's no sense of symmetry about the hedge. You can see if you look closely, there are sections that are all purple, so there's been several purple trees put together, yes. and then there's a batch of green, yes. and then there might be a long patch where there's green, purple, green, purple. So they've gone out of their way not to make it too symmetrical. And regular, yeah, yeah. Yes. What about the issue that we mentioned with the Leylandi hedge about nutrients and water? Yeah, well, if you're going to grow a border in front of any hedge, yes. particularly a largish hedge, because a largish hedge will by nature need a largish root system to hold mm -hmm. it up, then you do have to give the plants in front a little bit more care and attention with regards to watering and with regards to feeding, because you're really going to be feeding the hedge as well as the plants in front. So yes, you have to put a little more effort into it. Uh -huh. Now I'm just seeing over here a box hedge, which is quite classic. Let's just go and have a quick conversation about box alternatives. What a good idea. Well, this is a bit of a classic, the, the box hedge. This is incredibly healthy, I must say. But box, I asked you before, I've heard about box blight and I've read about it in, in British uh, gardening books and magazines. Is that a problem here? No, at this stage it isn't. We don't have the box blight, nor do we have the box eating caterpillar that is rife in parts of Europe and Britain. Right. Uh, and they're trying to find ways to manage these disease and pest problems. And of course, whilst they're doing that, they're also considering the possibility of alternatives to box. Well, here we go. So mm. firstly, how yeah. tough is box? I mean, Australia, tough climate. Is yep. box the best thing to be using here? It's pretty good here in most cases. It, I mean, it will cope with ve fairly high temperatures as yep. long as you haven't just trimmed the hedge. Mm. Uh, it's very cold tolerant. So mm. obviously in Europe, it has to go down to far further temperatures, lower temperatures than we get. Yeah. But nonetheless, it will cope with anything we can throw at it in this country. But I have this awful feeling that although we haven't got these issues here yet, it's coming. It nearly always is. So we may, in fact, in the, in the end, have to deal with this. Yeah. And the trouble with box is that there's no absolutely perfect replacement for it. Otherwise, they'd have already been using it. Yes. Uh, box has a nice slow growth habit, so it can be trimmed once a year and it can stay neat and tidy. Mm -hmm. It makes very good low to medium height hedges. I was going to ask, I mean, just looking at this one, which is quite tall, it's about yeah. a metre or so, how tall could you get a box hedge to go? There is a garden in Ireland called Burr Castle mm -hmm. that apparently has the Guinness Book of Records tallest box hedge in the world. Well, and I've go. stood next to it. I mean, it's a pretty rangy looking hedge. It's not exactly well trimmed, mm. or at least the time I was there, it wasn't. But I think in the old measurements, it's about 30 feet tall. <gasps> That's enormous. <laughs> yeah, it was truly tall. It's a double hedge. You walk down between the two hedges and I think it was 30 feet. But again, one of our viewers might in fact correct me if I'm wrong. All right, so alternatives then. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, in Australia, we can use some Australian native plants, but a lot of our native plants with small fine leaves like this that could be trimmed into a nice neat hedge don't have the same longevity as box. Yes. So things like uh, native rosemary, the western gears can be used as hedging. Uh, some of the corriers make quite good hedges. Yes. Uh, but a lot of these plants don't have the longevity of a box hedge. But having said that, they might last long enough. Mm, mm. And so it may not matter too much. Uh, in exotic plants, there's a few small leafed uh, euonymus, evergreen euonymus that could do the job. Mm -hmm. And there's the little tiny leaf Japanese uh, hollies as well, the Ilex cronata types. They can also make quite a good hedge, mm. but none of them have quite the same oomph mm. as box. Box is a great hedging material. Of course it is. So there'll probably never be an absolutely perfect replacement. No. What will probably happen as time goes on, they will hopefully breed box resistant. that is resistant yeah, to yeah, the yeah. issue. And that's what they've got to hope for, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a hedge that I'm very fond of, yes. and- uh, Tell me a hedge you're fond of, Stephen. Well, I'm fond of lots of hedges. I mean, I've liked all the hedges we've seen in the garden here today, but a hedging plant that I'm quite fond of for hedging that is really good for our climate uh, is Aliagnus submacrophylla which is also known as Aliagnus abengii. Uh, it's commonly known as a Russian olive. Uh, it's not an olive. Uh, it has rounded silver gray leaves with a whiter reverse. Mm -hmm. It is completely drought tolerant. It is heat tolerant. It is cold tolerant in the Australian environment. Wow. It's pretty bomb proof. And if you're looking for a hedge that's sort of perhaps two meters to three, mm -hmm. then Aliagnus uh, submacrophylla would be an absolutely ideal plant. It can be trimmed into steps. It doesn't have to be 
be dead square. It has tiny flowers, which are not particularly obvious, but the flowers do have a nice perfume. Yep. And so it's worth growing for that as well. And it gives that sort of Mediterranean feel, being a slightly greyish green, that sort of olivey look, which I think is appropriate in our environment and climate. So there you go. So Ali Agnes would be my medium height hedge alternative. Okay. Well, here we are, Stephen, surveying the estate. I must say, I've loved our hedge special. I've never really given hedges much thought, to be honest. Yeah, well, on the Grand Estate, hedges are very important, and sometimes in suburbia. Oh, I was going to say, even in a small context, mm. you can use smaller things. Now, so this is my next question for you. If you don't have the grand sweeping estate that we have here, but mm. you do have a smaller um, city garden, or even a terrace garden, what plants could you use to create a smaller hedge? All right, well, there's lots of different plants that you can use. Most of them won't be the classical ones because we're already familiar with box and you know the and privet, privet, your favourite. Yeah, privet, my favourite. My favourite. Uh, so, but there's lots of smaller plants. I mean, one plant that I'd like to see used as hedging more is the Chilean guava or Agni berry, Agni oh, molinae. Yeah. That will create a nice low hedge with box-like leaves, and it actually has edible fruit. And the fruit smells of strawberries as it ripens. So, oh. fabulous shrub, reasonably hardy, not often seen in Australia, probably not drought proof completely but mm. you know with modicum of watering it's it's pretty tough so any other edible things uh if for a taller hedge you could do worse in an australian environment than grow one of the fajoas or guavas as a hedge really? evergreen shrubs attractive flowers very pretty fruit very nice tasting fruit they would make good hedges up to around about the two to three meter mark or mm. more uh, and could be very very serviceable in a suburban size setting mm. and i've also seen I don't know what the botanic name is, but it's called Indian Hawthorn, which uh, I've seen yes. clipped. Yes. Could you use that? Yeah, Raphaelipus is the botanical name of Indian Hawthorn. It can be used. Its leaves are getting up to a size, though, where trimming can become an issue when the leaves get really big if you're ah. in close contact with the shrubs. If it's at a distance and you're cutting through the foliage, it doesn't matter. But if you're in a smallish garden or a smallish space, if you've got big leaf things and you're trimming them with head shears, then you're cutting through leaves and that actually will make quite a difference to the aesthetic appeal of the hedge. Right, right. So, so smaller it, leaves are better. Oh, okay. And in terms of, of trimming, early spring before it's put on its growth, would that be the point where you did it or the end of the season generally? You, you generally with most hedging would do your trimming in cool weather, but at the end of spring, early summer, when the main spring flush of growth is over. So what's going to happen is uh, it will slow the growth up. So any regrowth you get won't be as vigorous as the summer comes on. Aha, uh -huh. good to know. Any more last wildcard species options? Well, I have to say, there's yes. nothing wrong with being a little bit experimental. I mean, yes. many plants can be trimmed, shaped or cut. Yes. So you could look at a, a whole gamut of options. And I'm just remembering, I've seen a picture, I think it's a Frida Kahlo's house or perhaps Diego Rivera in Mexico. And they had a hedge of very tall, straight cactus. And it was extraordinary. Yeah. Except I wouldn't actually see it necessarily as a hedge because you're not trimming it. Well, yeah, hedges are uh, invariably trimmed oh, I see. to create so the is, look. This is the row of cacti. Yeah, or a screen. A screen yeah, of cacti. It could be a screen of cacti. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, but I wouldn't quite see it as a hedge. This has been amazing. Mr. Ryan, where could you lead us next? Well, I don't know, but we may even revisit this garden to have a look at some of the fantastic sculpture that's here. I think we should, because I think the viewers would have got some glimpses of the fact that this is an amazing garden. So hopefully the owner will let us come back and roam free. So you'll have to subscribe and hit the notification bell to see if we do come back here, because yep. we post every week. And we will, I'm sure we will. We will. But until then, we look forward to seeing you next week. All right, goodbye all.